Huntington's disease is a very difficult disease to describe. Uh, and it's quite unknown as well, so uh, it makes it even harder. I tend to try and keep it simple and just uh, say it's, it's a cross between Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, uh, but it can happen at any age. The involuntary movements of Huntington's disease um, tend to cause a lot of problems because people mistake them for, for being drunk. Um, and I know people that have been arrested and uh, or they've had their neighbours call uh, call the police because they've seen yeah, seen someone drunk with their kids, etc, etc. So it causes a lot of problems, a lot of confusion and a lot of misunderstanding and that's essentially what happens when people have Huntington's disease, they are misunderstood. My earliest memories of Huntington's disease were of my father. Um, he was diagnosed when I was seven years old, but at that time I didn't really understand, uh, you know, what was wrong with him. Um, my mother told me that he had Huntington's disease and that he was gradually going to progress as the years went on. Um, but I was, as I said, I was seven years old and I was more interested in, in playing around. Um, and I didn't see anything wrong with my dad. Um, so it was really in, uh, a few years later when I was uh, you know, 11, 12, 13 that I really began to notice my dad's symptoms as they progressed. Um, you know, he was tripping over and um, breaking things and, and stuttering, losing his speech, etc. Uh, so those are the first things that I noticed, essentially, about Huntington's disease. As my father's condition uh, progressed, it uh, affected family life uh, massively. Uh, my mother had to quit her job and become a full-time carer. Um, and it started to affect uh, myself as well because I didn't understand what was going on. I didn't understand why my dad was getting worse, you know, year after year. Um, so I kind of uh, started to rebel and uh, really didn't have a father figure to, to, you know, keep me in check. So I got in trouble at school and uh, eventually I left school and, and um, home life got more difficult for me. You know, watching my dad, you know, progress and not understanding why this was happening, I, I, I just uh, I, I couldn't get my head around it at all. So I tried to run away from the situation uh, once or twice, <laughs> came back. But um, yeah, it had, it had a huge effect on my life growing up. It just became a very stressful household and uh, it was a quite a quick change from a, a nice normal family to a very stressful home. So yeah, it had a huge effect on the family. I decided to learn more about Huntington's disease uh, when I was about 18. Um, I'd been working for a couple of years and my mother was, was still caring for my dad at home. Uh, and I took the decision that I needed to, to stop working and, and help uh, look after my father because my mother was struggling. Um, it was really then that I decided that I needed to understand this disease properly. Uh, and I'd always known that I'd had a 50% risk. I'd known that since I was very young, but I'd never really thought about it up until I was about 18. Uh, so uh, that's essentially why I started learning more about Huntington, so that I could understand my risk better and understand the disease. So, I, uh, And as a result, I began to understand why my father was behaving the way he was. And, you know, life started to make more sense again at that point. Um, there aren't really any treatments for Huntington's disease, so there's, there's nothing that's going to really benefit from, from testing other than uh, knowing yourself, you know, mentally, that you're either going to have Huntington's or not. Um, so it's a very personal choice, there's no real other benefits to it other than that. Um, but I was one of these people that wanted to know, and, and that's why I decided to get tested. When we got, we got the news, the bad news, that I, I was you know, one day going to get into the disease like my dad. Uh, I felt very sorry for my mom because uh, you know, I'm an only child and, uh, you know, her husband was already late stages of Huntington's disease and she just lost her father the night before. And now she just found out her son had an incurable uh, genetic disease. It's, uh, it was a pretty rough time for her. So I felt more sorry for her than myself and I was more worried for her than me. The testing involves about six months of genetic counselling to make sure that you can cope with a good or bad result. And then once you've been through that, uh, it's a simple blood test at the hospital, just like any other blood test. Um, 
and then it's about a two, three week wait for your results, which is quite painful. <laughs> um, and then obviously on results day, you have, uh, usually your, your neurologist is there and, and your genetic counselor is there as well. So they're uh, ready to, to help you along. When I tested positive, I, uh, I felt uh, very sad, very down. Um, I knew the likelihood is that there won't be any treatments around to, to, to help me. So essentially I, I was given a, a death sentence that day. Um, uh, but as the months went on, you kind of just deal with it. And, you know, I, I recognize that there's still a lot of years, a lot of good years to be had in my life. And I, I shouldn't waste those years. So you just have to keep moving forwards, being positive. You can't tell when Huntington's disease will strike. Um, you can guesstimate. Uh, essentially, I, I could say it could start uh, around the same time as my father, which was late 30s. Um, but there's no telling and, and nothing is certain. So it could start next week or it could start when I'm 60 or 70 years old. Um, and they can only really diagnose me uh, when I have obvious symptoms at the moment, but uh, they are working on uh, research which will hopefully be able to diagnose people earlier than that because Huntington's affects the brain uh, many years before you can see obvious symptoms. Huntington's affects me day to day mainly just through uh, mentally coping. Uh, I have my good days, I have my bad days, like anybody. Um, uh, and really to try and get more good days and bad days, I, I, I try and do as much positive things to help uh, the Huntington's disease community as I can. I volunteer for the national organization here, HDA, um, and I give my time willingly to uh, talk to other young people that are growing up in families with Huntington's disease. And I do fundraising as well, so this all makes me feel more positive about, uh, about life. The purpose of my fundraising uh, is to create an organization uh, to support young people. Uh, it's going to be called the Huntington's Disease Youth Organization, or as the cool people call it, HDO. <laughs> um, there isn't a lot of information available for young people at the moment. And uh, what information is out there is, is only uh, in English. So what I'm trying to do is create an organization that improves the information out there already, and then uh, expands on it and, and translates uh, into many different languages so that we can start getting more support out uh, internationally to young people who aren't at the moment getting any support. I get my information from uh, the internet mainly uh, from HD organisations around the world um, but like I said that isn't really aimed at young people and a lot of it especially if it's talking about research is not understandable <laughs> in the slightest so um, that's essentially why I want to create information specifically for young people so that they can start to understand earlier in life. I'm involved in as many research projects as I can be at the moment. As I'm not uh, symptomatic, I can't participate in clinical trials, um, but I can participate in other things like observational trials. So I'm in one or two observational trials, um, which I attend once a year, and I've just recently uh, got into uh, a study called Predict HD, uh, where they do MRI scans uh, to see how HD affects the brain earlier in life. So I'll be participating in that in London. I got involved in research because they need participants. And um, you know, if I, if I do want a treatment, although it's a slim hope, but if I do want that treatment to help save my life, then I have to uh, expect to give something back. And, I give back by participating in research and as, as many uh, research projects as I can. I don't mind traveling uh, a distance to do it either. I think you know, we have to get involved uh, as young as possible as well. There is a hope of some treatment. Um, I would say there wasn't, even just a few years ago, there maybe wasn't as much hope. Um, but with uh, an organization called Cure Huntington's Disease Initiative has come into play in the last few years, which has brought a lot of money into HD research um, and they're working very hard on a lot of different angles and targets so uh, hopefully there will actually be some treatments that I can uh, participate in the clinical trials 
and uh, see if they work and see if they're effective and maybe one of them will be uh, good for me. I'm very well connected to, to everybody, uh, any, everybody and anybody in the HD community really. Uh, Facebook is a, a wonderful thing. <laughs> so um, I have a, a good relationship with a lot of young people in the HD world and uh, all around the world and I'm able to uh, talk to them on a regular basis and you know, if they have an issue they want to discuss they can always reach me so uh, there's a good connection uh, between the community and you know we kind of look after each other essentially. I seek support from uh, the national organisation here, the Huntington's Disease Association um, but I don't really seek it for myself, I, I tend to cope uh, pretty well uh, as I am, don't really need to access any support, um, but I see the need for more support for the rivers and that's why I, I work with uh, the HDA and volunteer for them to try and improve their youth service and, and make sure that other young people are growing, you know, growing up with their parents suffering, make sure that they get the support that they need to get through that. Other members of my family have been affected by Huntington's disease. Uh, my grandmother uh, died before I was born um, and she had four children at risk. Uh, one was my father who has now died from Huntington's disease um, and just recently my auntie uh, was diagnosed as well and obviously I've tested positive so I know that I will get in the future as well and there are still many more at risk. Before I was born my, my granddad looked after my grandma who was suffering with Huntington's disease and he chose not to talk about Huntington's disease at all to his four children who were at risk. Uh, he didn't mention the risk and he didn't mention the name of the disease either. So uh, when my dad met my mother and they had me, uh, they had no idea that I was 50% at risk of having Huntington's disease. They had no idea that I was passing that risk on. Um, and when my dad was diagnosed uh, when I was only seven years old, I think they were very angry towards uh, my granddad for, for keeping that from them. Um, when my father progressed uh, with the disease, uh, my family, my outside family, tended not to talk about it and, and would rather, you know, talk about happy things and, you know, uh, normal things. Uh, they didn't want to face up to the issue of Huntington's disease and they would just say that uh, oh, Uncle John is ill, you know, rather than explain Huntington's disease to their own children. Um, and this caused me a lot of problems when I tested positive myself when I was 19 because uh, I wanted to talk about it and essentially I had no one to talk about it with in my family. They, they kind of just ignored the issue. So. Um, I, I felt very isolated in my family for a while, for a year or two, and I, I've had to work uh, very hard on changing that mentality in my family. Uh, we're now very open about it, but it took a lot of work. Um, when my father died in 2009, uh, I had the opportunity to speak at his funeral. And uh, originally there was going to be no mention, really, of Huntington's disease at his funeral, and I found this very kind of upsetting for me and it made me angry because it was a big part of his life even though it wasn't a happy part it was a big part it affected me um, so I wanted to, to get up and, and talk about Huntington's disease uh, and and that's exactly what I did at the funeral I got up in front of uh, our whole family and you know friends of the family and discussed Huntington's disease and talked about how it affected my dad and the decisions that he made the brave decisions that he made uh, when he had the disease and really showed that it's you know it's something that yeah, you don't have to be afraid of. And we can discuss it and we can be open about it, and we should support each other as a family. And and from there they've been great. My family they've got very behind me and supported me, and uh, they've been on fundraising events with me now. And my little cousins talk about it all the time, and they're very open about it. So it's it's a much better feeling around the family now than it was before. My motivation to set up HDO was really to make sure that young people. Uh, didn't grow up without support, uh, essentially like I did. Um, I felt if I'd have support when I was younger, uh, I would have stayed in school and uh, I would have understood the disease uh, earlier in life and I would have been able to, to cope better and, and the impact of HD in the family would have been less 
how to have that support. So that's essentially why I set it up. In terms of the care provided for my father, uh, the only real improvement I could suggest was the occupational therapists who uh, didn't take each case individually, which is what they need to do when someone has Huntington's disease. Uh, for example, we wanted a stair lift for my father um, so that we could get him up and down the stairs and into bed every night. Um, it was taking us about 30 minutes to get him up the stairs and it took uh, two of us either side of him to make sure that he didn't fall. Uh, a very arduous process. Um, so we wanted a stair lift to, to kind of resolve that problem. And the OT suggested that we uh, get a bedroom put in downstairs and a, an extension out back into the garden and, uh, you know, put a lift uh, where the television is right now. And it's, it essentially it was just too much, uh, too expensive. And it felt like they were trying to change uh, the family home into a care home. And that's exactly where we didn't want my dad. We didn't want him in a care home. We wanted him in a family home. Um, so we had to buy the stair lift ourselves without the support of the OTs. Um, and the stair lift, uh, you know, kept my dad at home for a further five years until he died. So it was a vital uh, tool that we had, but we had to pay for it ourselves because the OTs uh, weren't open-minded enough about what they could provide. The one thing I think there could be more of in terms of caring for someone with Huntington's disease um, is uh, an individual approach. Uh, take each case as it comes and assess the situation and don't just go in there with your, uh, you know, your 101 rule book and, and talk right out of it. My feelings for the future are positive and hopeful. I, uh, I'm hopeful for a treatment uh, before I get ill. And uh, in the meantime, I'm just going to be as positive as I can and keep moving forwards and keep uh, being productive for the HD community and providing as much support for young people as I can.